were picking up where we left off. Sullivan had been keeping book on Hoover for some time. He is a skilled writer. His book could be devastating should he choose to expose such matters as the supervisor who handled Hoover's stock portfolio and tax matter. The painting of Hoover's house by the FBI exhibits section the ghost writing of Hoover's books by FBI employees, the rewriting of FBI history, and the donation by admiring facility owners of accommodations and services which are often in fact underwritten by employee contribution. The report recommended Hoover's retirement before the end of the year. Nixon wholeheartedly agreed. Hoover, he said, has to realize that he can't stay forever. I think I could get him to resign if I put him direct if I put to him directly that without it he's going to be hurt politically. But I want this closely held. It's got it's just got to be. Despite lengthy pep preparation, scripting and rehearsals, the president attempted and failed again. The reason was explained by Summers. Contrary to what Nixon imagined at first, the threat of the White House wiretaps transcripts had not evaporated when Sullivan handed over the FBI copies to Assistant Attorney General Meridian. Mardian. I've been saying Meridian, haven't I? It's Mardian. When Mardian checked the list, he discovered some of the transcripts were missing. They had been retained all along by Edgar. Though Nixon openly claimed to his death that Hoover never gave any indication to me of blackmail, the truth was known to his inmates. Months after his meeting with Hoover, Nixon confided with Ehrlichman. The meeting was a total strikeout, he told me. I'd have to force him out. It was my conclusion, Ehrlichman said, that the president believed that Hoover's resignation before the election would raise more problems than it would solve. Likewise, Kissinger recalled, Nixon thought Hoover was quite capable of using the knowledge he acquired as part of his investigations to blackmail the president. So rather than him heralding his dismal the press reported that Nixon wanted Hoover to remain in office. In one of the final interviews of his life, Hoover declared himself fit and determined to carry on. Many of our great artists and composers, he said, did their best work in their 80s. They were judged on performance, not age. Look at Bernard Baroque. He was brilliant in the 90s and Herbert Hoover and Douglas MacArthur in their 80s, that is my policy. Consequently, with COINTELPRO on ice, the FBI stupefied, the CIA cut off from domestic intelligence, the administration blackmailed, and Kissinger's authority blocked along with his patron's economic interests. Nixon was at his wit's end. Besides everything else, he was certain his White House still harbored a mole, someone who might again leak secrets to the press. What's more, the president was still outraged that Hoover had blocked the investigation of a perceived traitor and suspected communist, Daniel Ellsberg. Hoover had apparently befriended Ellsberg's father-in-law, so he felt obliged to come to the family's aid. The FBI was not going to pursue the Ellsberg's case, Nixon wrote in his memoirs. Then we would have to do it ourselves, beyond Watergate. In June 1971, seated in his Oval Office, Nixon told his aide, Charles Colson, I don't give a damn how it's done. Do whatever has to be done to stop these leaks and prevent further unauthorized disclosures. I want to know who's behind this, whatever the cost. The directive led to the formation of the plumbers and then to Watergate. The cast of characters is now well known. The chain of command went from Nixon to Ehrlichman to Crow to y and Young with Colson and the president's counsel, John Dean, putting their nickels worth in the field assigned to 
do in the field assigned to do the White House's dirty work were Howard Hunt and Gordon Liddy. Hunt was a 52-year-old career CIA officer who had technically retired from the agency and gone freelance. Previous to Watergate, he had been investigated by the Warren Commission for his CIA connections and possible role in the assassination of JFK. He was allegedly seen on the grassy knoll behind a puff of smoke at the time the shots were fired and had no alibi. Liddy had served as an assistant district attorney in New York, then as a special assistant in the Nixon Treasury Department since leaving the FBI in 1962. Interesting that Kissinger wasn't in the plumber's chain of command, I thought, particularly since he was in charge of the 40 Committee, the group that took charge of authorizing covert actions by the CIA. He would have likely known about the entire affair since it was essentially a CIA-run operation, according to the Rockefeller Commission. But his name failed to appear in the report and, the C and CIA reprimand. I considered that Nixon may have suspected Kissinger's involvement in the Ellsberg case and purposely kept him in the dark about the plumbers. But that wasn't likely either, I realized. Kissinger's is... Kissinger's intelligence network exceeded Hoover's and infiltrated the CIA's by then. If anything went on, Kissinger most likely knew about it. He probably still does today. Kissinger Rockefeller coup? Then it occurred to me how Kissinger came out on top. He outlasted, he outlasted everyone. In fact, he's still considered the most powerful foreign policy advisor in the world. Had a Kissinger Rockefeller coup actually occurred? I reflected on the fact that Nixon held Nelson Rockefeller in disregard and snubbed him, Nixon's 1968 presidential contender, by giving Kissinger the ro job Rocky expected. When Kissinger was selected instead of the banking mogul, Rockefeller's staff was shocked. Kissinger himself suggested that Nixon reconsider Rockefeller rather than him to lead the Defense Department. Before that, Kissinger told Gloria Steinman that the only way he would go to Washington is if Rockefeller became his boss. In retrospect, that's what happened. Rockefeller remained Kissinger's patron before, during, and after the Nixon era. I reflected on the fact that it was largely Rockefeller's influence and contacts that helped catapult Kissinger to the top of the business consulting industry. A partial list of his international clients was remarkable to say the least. American Express, Anna Hoosier Bush, Atlantic Richfield, Coca-Cola, GTE, Chase Manhattan, and Midline Banks, Bell Telephone, H.G. Hines, Revlon, Union Carbide, and Volvo, to name just a few. And then there was Merck and Co. Merck and Company. Isn't that interesting, I thought, reflecting on my knowledge of George Merck's leadership of America's biological weapon industry, as well as the experimental hepatitis B vaccines Merck and Company prepared for the American gay community. I considered the fact that Nixon and Hoover stood in the way of both Kissinger and Rockefeller. Financially and politically, Hoover was overtly hostile toward Kissinger. He hated Jews, wouldn't take orders, and catered to organized crime. And neither Kissinger nor Rockefeller thought much of Nixon. At best, they perceived him as inept. At worst, they considered him a paranoid maniac and a mutual threat. Moreover, both Nixon and Hoover had potentially dangerous intelligence data on Kissinger, as well as Rockefeller. Hoover held a big file of dirt on Rockefeller, and the two held wiretap transcripts that could have incriminated Kissinger as well as his closest aides. Rockefeller, I also recalled, perceived as Eisenhower's international affairs assistant. He resigned when Eisenhower refu refused to endure his Vietnam War plans. Billions in military industrial revenue, 
That's when Eisenhower issued his warning about the evil military-industrial complex. Now Kissinger was playing the same role for Nixon with the East Coast establishment, the Rockefellers, the media and banking elite pulling the strings. Moreover, after Nixon was ousted and Ford became president, Kissinger petitioned Ford to select Rockefeller to be the new vice president. Having hundreds of political colleagues, Isaacson reported, Kissinger felt the most trust and affection to anyone in public life for Rockefeller. Then following their White House communion, the Kissingers and the Rockefellers spent New Year's as together at the house at the outset of 1975 at Dorado Beach in Puerto Rico. Isaacson reported that Henry felt very good about himself at the time, relaxing in the sun and married to a socially impeccable former Rockefeller aide. Kissinger seemed more at peace with himself than he had been for a long time. Naturally, he seemed more at peace. I observed their principal political rivals were destroyed. They now maintained sole control of the White House. They had played a, de a determining role in discrediting Nixon. Could they have been behind the plumbers getting caught? And what about Hoover's untimely and mysterious death? Hagen Deep Throat? I flashed back to watching a CBS special I had seen a few years ago. The program cited Haig and Kissinger among the likeliest suspects to have played the role of Deep Throat. Since Kissinger and Haig allegedly had alibis, Mike Wallace concluded Deep Throat was Patrick Gray, a former assistant attorney general who was appointed acting director of FBI of the FBI six weeks before the break-in at the Watergate. Neither Woodward nor 76-year-old in 1992 Gray confirmed the report. However, the two sources outright denied it. Charles Bates, the former assistant director of the FBI at the time of the break-in, and Howard Hunt, one of the CIA operative plumbers, it wouldn't be the first or last time CBS and Mike Wallace spread lies to cover up government-incriminating truths, I realized. It was Rockefeller, I considered, who enlisted Kissinger to join his international military security business during the meeting at Quantico. In 1955, Kissinger's Quantico report laid out Rockefeller's, that is, American foreign policy objectives and foreshadowed over four decades of violent American history. Most important, it contained military proposals that required, of course, far more spending. And it was Kissinger who drafted Haig to be his chief of aid of the National Security Council, and Joseph Calafino recommended Haig. The recollection suddenly took on greater meaning. Califano, Califano, the former Secretary of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, DHEW, during the Carter administration, the man who gave us the U.S. Surgeon General his orders when I was completing my MPH at Harvard. Isn't that interesting? My mind raced to consider the possible role Califano, Califano played during this perilous period of American history. Califano became secretary of DHEW in 1977. I recalled that was just when the large Merck and United States Public Health Service gay hepatitis study was getting underway. As the secretary of the Department of Health and Education and Welfare, Califano was empowered to direct both foreign and domestic vaccination programs for the United States Public Health Service, United States Assistant for International Development, as well as the World Health Organization. After letting the Califano connection sink in a bit, I continued to consider Deep Throat. Deep Throat fed Woodward and the Washington Post the inside poop on Kissinger, Rockefeller political enemies. 
That was traditional CIA counterintelligence operations over which Kissinger was in charge at the time. That was why Hoover ordered the FBI to break ties with the Washington Post when he knew he was being influenced by Kissinger, most likely through his Washington Special Action Group. For an organizational chart of the U.S. national security system under Kissinger, okay, see figure 11.2 for an organize, for an organizational chart on the U.S. national security system under Kissinger, also see reference 10, what are they talking about? I don't see anything. I don't see anything. Where were we? With the score of CIA and FBI sponsored break-ins that went unreported during that time, maybe it's not so astonishing they caught the plumbers at Watergate. Deep Throat was most likely Hague. I searched the library shelves once again in an effort to investigate my hunch. In Len Kolodny's fascinating book, Silent Coup, The Removal of Richard Nixon, I learned that my suspicions were well-founded. Not only was Haig exposed for his virtual certain role as Deep Throat, but Bob Woodward, who himself published a treaty on the CIA, was revealed to be a communication specialist for American intelligence. In fact, Kolodny provided substantial documented evidence that Woodward routinely briefed Hay at the Pentagon prior to their Nixon White House assignments. Then in Summer's book, I read that many believed Watergate was only the tip of the iceberg. During that Nixon era, the CIA conducted hundreds of break-ins in people's homes and businesses, into people's homes and businesses, all of whom the administration considered to be its enemies. Their spectrum of targets ranged from radicals and subversives to high-ranking diplomats and politicians. One such victim, Summers assures us, was J. Edgar Hoover. Why had the plumbers gotten caught at the water gate and nowhere else? Could it have been a play, perhaps with Haig as a quarterback, to initiate Nixon's downfall, thus facilitating a Rockefeller Kissinger coup? Prelude to the Sting. Isaacson's book revealed that Nixon's relationship with Kissinger had steadily deteriorated. During his five and a half years in office, Nixon's administration for Kissinger Nixon's admiration for Kissinger would gradually become more infected by jealousy and suspicions of disloyalty. With no personal affections to serve as a foundation for their relationship, what had been a love-hate alliance eventually tilted toward the latter. As the president's dependency on Kissinger grew, his resentment and bitterness increased. Ultimately, when the plumbers failed to find evidence of the inside leak they expected to find in the office of Ellsberg's psychiatrist, Nixon was in deep trouble. Not only did the media begin chasing all the president's men, but Hoover knew the truth about the whole affair. Nixon had informed the director personally of his intention to enter Ellsberg's office. Hoover would have learned this anyway. By that time, his intelligence network had thoroughly infiltrated the White House. Push finally came to shove when Hoover learned that Liddy's written report calling for the director's forced removal, since it was clear he would not go gracefully, nor would Nixon be able to shame him from office. Hoover's assassination became a clear option. The director recognized his predicament. On New Year's Day, 1972, while awaiting his flight back to Washington, Hoover spent 45 minutes 45 morose minutes discussing his problems with Kenneth Whitaker, his special agent in charge of the city. 
parked in his limousine outside Miami's International Airport. Whitaker got, a, Whitaker got an earful about how upset Hoover was about his trouble with Nixon. It was the last time I saw Hoover alive. Back home, Hoover took a curious step. He asked Andrew Tully, a trusted journalist, to lunch in private. I have something to say, he told Tully. But I don't want you to publish it until I'm dead, Tully agreed. Then the reporter asked, is the president pressuring you to retire? Not anymore, he's not, Hoover replied. I put the kibosh on those Jaspers who want to get rid of me. The president asked me what thoughts I had about retirement, and I said none. Then I told him why. I told him he needed me around. Having secured intelligence and intelligence wiretaps on virtually all White House notables, Hoover likely, likely suspected a Kissinger-Rockefeller coup was underway. Perhaps this is what he meant when he said Nixon needed me around. Later, Hoover threatened to expose the administration's ongoing domestic snooping ring. This fit the story relayed by James McCord, another former FBI and CIA agent. He said, Hoover resolved that he would have to go to Congress with the facts. Regarding the wiretapping of the news media, the National Security Council staff, and of Ellsberg, undoubtedly Nixon, Kissinger, Haig, and other National Security Council staffers feared this as well. The last straw was a Nixon damning expose that Hoover fed life. It spilled the beans on how the White House had intervened to help Arnhold Smith, one of Nixon's best friends and a bookmaker called Joel Elysio, another Nixon backer to shake off corruption and tax charges. Hoover the article said, had used his personal influence to help defeat the White House moves to assure that Elysio faced trial. This, McCord believed, was what really set Nixon and Ed Edgar's throat. The assassination of J. Edgar Hoover. Summers filed an intriguing investigation report along with a startling conclusion. J. Edgar Hoover was very likely assassinated. A year after Watergate, Mark Fraser, a young reporter working in Washington, was to pick up an intriguing lead. Three sources, he learned, had given affidavits to the Senate Watergate Committee referring to two break-in operations at Edgar's home and in Rock Creek Park. They were, allegedly, directed by Gordon Liddy. In the welter of the news arising from Watergate, or possibly because of official media censorship, Frazier was unable to get the story published in a Washington paper. Instead, it ran in a university publication, the Harvard Crimson. Hoover's home, the article said, had been targeted twice for break-ins. The first operation, in late winter of 1972, was intended to retrieve documents that were thought to be used as potential blackmail against the White House. This attempt failed, but was followed by another which succeeded. This time, Frazier reported, whether through misunderstanding or design, a poison of the thiophosphate genre was placed on Hoover's personal toilet articles. Thiophosphate, a chemical commonly found in insecticides, is extremely toxic to human beings if ingested, inhaled, or absorbed through the skin. Exposure can cause fatal heart attacks and can only be detected by an autopsy performed within hours of the lethal poisoning. Hmm. Gordon Liddy today denies knowledge of any break-in at Edgar's house. Hunt contacted in Mexico, said curtly, it was a matter of total disinterest to me. 
Nixon's former chief of staff, Haldeman, however, accepts that something of the kind may have happened. I have to concede the possibility, he said. I think Nixon was capable at the time of saying to Colson, I want this done. I don't want any arguments about it. I don't want you to talk to Haldeman because he'll just say, don't do it. Go ahead and get it done. Watergate burglar Felipe de Diego, de Diego, Felipe de Diego, who today claims ignorance of the Hoover break-ins and first said he knew about the operation and hoped to soon be able to talk about everything. Then questioned again, he withdrew his comments. At home in Florida, however, he told Dade County State's attorney Richard Gerstein that he had information on uglier, other burglaries of a political nature. Another of the Watergate burglars, Frank Sturgis, said in 1988 that D. Diego told him about the Hoover break-ins immediately after Edgar's death. Felipe told me about it, he said. I suspected the CIA was behind it. I told him, I guess our friends probably wanted to go over there and see what kind of documents Hoover had stashed away. Felipe laughed and said, that's dangerous. It's dangerous. And we didn't talk about it anymore. Sturgis admitted that the burglars were active in Washington earlier than emerged from the official Watergate investigation. Asked if he himself was involved in the Hoover break-ins, he hedged. I'm not saying yes to my involvement. Let me say no to that. It opens up a can of worms. Chief Plummer Crow coincidentally served time where former Congressman Neil Gallagher was jailed as a result of Hoover's malicious attack. In Allenwood, Pennsylvania's minimum security prison, in 1991, Gallagher signed a sworn affidavit which testified, I was the prison librarian and Crow would come in one night when I was about to close the place and there were only two of us there. We talked about Hoover. I said, I thought the circumstances of Hoover's death were a bit strange. Because of my war with Hoover, I'd followed, I followed everything about him closely, I said to Crow. Hoover knew everything that was going on in Washington. He must have surely known about the plumbers and everything. Do you think Hoover was blackmailed by the president? And then I said, and it surprises me now. Did you guys knock Hoover off? You had the troops to do it and the reason. It took several seconds for it to sink in. Then Crow literally jumped out of his chair. And in a highly charged voice, he sort of screamed. We didn't knock off Hoover. He knocked himself off. And I said, my God, that explains a lot about the bastard's death coming that way, the way it did. And with that, Crow rushed out of the library. We never had another conversation the rest of the time we were in Allenwood. After Hoover's body was discovered by his housekeepers and his lover Clyde Tolson was alerted, Robert Chaussier, Edgar's physician, arrived on the scene. Mr. Hoover had been dead for some hours, he recalled. I was rather surprised by his sudden death because he was in good health. I do not recall prescribing him medicine for blood pressure or heart disease. There was nothing to lead anyone to expect him to die at that time, except for his age. Later that morning, two medical examiners, Dr. Richard Welton and Coroner James Luke, surveyed surveilled the situation. It was totally normal, Welton recalled. There was nothing to suggest trauma. Hoover was in an age group where it could be expected. It is common for such a person to be found dead after apparently trying to get to the bathroom during the night. On his way out, considering the need for an autopsy, 
Welton said to Luke, what if someone should pop up six months from now and say someone had been feeding Hoover arsenic? We'll think we, we'll think we should have done an autopsy. Summers concluded that neither pathologist had any reason to suppose anyone had been feeding Edgar arsenic or any other poison. No one knew that the Watergate burglars even existed, let alone that two of them had consulted a CIA expert about ways of killing columnist Jack Anderson, including the option of planting poison in his medicine cabinet. They knew nothing of the alleged break-in at Edgar's home, nothing of the suggestion that a poison might have been placed on Hoover's personal toilet articles, a poison capable of inducing cardiac arrest. They knew nothing of the call Nixon had reportedly made to Edgar's late and previous night, telling him it was time to step down. Three days after Hoover's demise, having decided against the autopsy, Luke signed the certificate of death. John Edgar Hoover, male, white, occupation, FBI, immediate cause, hypertensive cardiovascular disease, life after Hoover. All of this meant that from the mid-1970 to mid-1973, the CIA operated without any interference from the Justice Department. During this time and following Hoover's death, the CIA grew in strength as the nucleus of foreign and domestic espionage operations. Despite the embarrassment of getting caught playing a central role in the infamous Watergate break-ins, the CIA was hardly chastised by Congress. It continued to expand agency operations at home and abroad under Kissinger and soon to be Chief of Staff Haig. The two Nixon administration survivors ran the CIA, State and Defense Departments. They reinstated COINTELPRO like operations, expanded its covert operations in Africa, and increased biological as well as chemical weapon research. In 1973, the CIA labored to maintain its positive public image. International condemnation over ongoing American biological warfare experiments was imminent. The Rockefeller Commission investigation on CIA wrongdoing was also about to begin, as was a congressional investigation in the aftermath of Watergate. It was then that CIA Director Richard Helms, succeeded shortly thereafter by William Colby, ordered by Mr. Sidney Gottlieb, Chief of the CIA's Technical Services Division, and former head of its MKUltra drug and mind control operation to destroy all records pertaining to the formulation, the development, and the retention of illegal biologicals that were used to wage war and experiment widely on third world populations. Helms's orders apparently came from his superior, Dr. Henry Kissinger. On, by May 1973, in the wake of the Watergate scandal, an international attention focused, as international attention focused on Nixon's fall from grace, a shadow government took control of America. The interim administration, which formed before President Ford was confirmed, was largely powered by Rockefeller and commanded, commandeered by Kissinger and Haig. During the following presidential campaign, Brzezinski, Jimmy Carter's campaign manager and old-time Kissinger nemesis from Harvard, launched an embedded attack against the incumbent's foreign policy, publishing in Foreign Affairs. He described Kissinger's tactics as covert, manipulative, and deceptive in style. It seems committed to a largely static view of the world based on traditional balance of power, seeking accommodation among the major powers on the basis of spheres of influence. Cold and accurate as it was, the irrepressible fact is Kissinger and his real politic survived. While campaigning for the presidency, Carter hailed Kissinger as the real foreign policy president of this country. 
under the Nixon Ford administration, he said in a speech, there has evolved a kind of secret there has evolved a kind of secretive man policy hold on there has evolved a kind of secretive closely guarded and amoral lone ranger foreign policy a one man policy of international adventure to these attacks, Carter added his standard refrain, our foreign policy should be as open and honest as the American people themselves. One year later, under the more open and honest political established by Carter Ray Ravenhot and Director of Population Control Programs for United States Aid for International Development, that says it all right there. Population control by USAID revealed the agency's intention to help sterilize one quarter of the world's women. He argued that this need stemmed from the administration's desire to protect United States corporate interests from the threat of third world revolution spawned by chronic unemployment. And that's it for today.